Welcome to the Hockey Writers Union Junction, a weekly show from our Columbus Blue Jackets insider, Mark Scheib, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, he covers everything that happens with the Jackets. So get ready. It's time for another get together at Union Junction. Hello, hockey fans. Welcome back to Union Junction. It is Thursday. It is March the 24th. We are on the other side of the trade deadline, finally. 33 trades um, gone by the board here. 54 players have been moved. Actually, it's less than that because of the Dodonoff news. So lots going on. Nick is with me here. Got a great show for you today because we're going to actually have Bob McGilligan joining us here in a little bit. The radio voice of the Columbus Blue Jackets is going to join us to talk about what he saw at the trade deadline and lots more about the blue jackets. But before we get to him, Nick, have you heard of the new endeavor that we're doing here with the hockey writers with the, the hockey writers betting guide? Actually, I I haven't, I guess I haven't been following the the team emails lately. Oh, see, if you read the team emails, you would know exactly what's going on with this, but really cool endeavor we're doing here. The website is stnbets.com and Kind of, it's a, it's a new endeavor that we're getting into. You, you see, all different places around the league are getting into, you know, the sports betting scene. You, you see DraftKings and other sites get affiliated with teams, get affiliated with leagues. So, if you need help with fantasy, if you need some betting advice, um, if you, if you need help picking players, you know, things like that, or just some different ideas. There's a whole wide variety of articles that are out there available. Our Rob Couch is actually out here writing different things. I know Chris Wassel, somebody that many of you would be familiar with, will um, write um, some different things. But it's not just a hockey. You can do there's, there's basketball, hockey, baseball, soccer, golf, football, all sorts of stuff out there. Again, stnbets.com. And yeah, check it out. A lot of great stuff, a lot of great information out there for those that are interested in the betting side of things. I guess I should have been reading up on this because I've been losing a lot of money. I'll see. And I see if you read <laughs> up on the guide, you can regain some of it back if the luck is on your side. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So um, fans, so st- stick with us here. Um, Bob Miguel is going to be joining us in a couple minutes. So um, we'll be right back. All right, fans, as promised, we are joined by the radio voice of the Columbus Blue Jackets. The trade deadline is come and gone. You know, you could argue that did it actually happen from a Blue Jackets perspective, but we have Bob McGilligan joining us to kind of go over all that stuff. How you doing, Bobby? I'm doing well, Mark. If you're going over the Blue Jackets stuff, this will be a short conversation, right? As you oh, said. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll be here for like three <laughs> minutes and be done. And we can all go back three. to our lives. <laughs> One trade. That should take about 38 seconds. Yeah, well, let's jump right jump right into it. Were, were you so surprised that it was as quiet as it was, and did you actually expect more? Uh, no, I wasn't really surprised because I think Max was the foregone conclusion that he would be gone. Um, after that, you know, the other two unrestricted free agents, Riona Corposalo and Dean Kukin, and, you know, let's just be honest about it. Uh, Corposalo has basically lost his value. Um, throughout this entire season. Actually, you could make the argument that he's lost it over the last two seasons, quite frankly. Uh, but there really was – I mean, what are you going to trade him for? You're going to take a sixth-round pick, seventh-round pick, and, and then are you going to do that right after Elvis Merzlikens gets injured and he's not able to play? So, you know, you're, you're keeping an NHL goalie that you're probably not going to get very much for anyway. So that didn't surprise me. And for Dean Kukin, look, Kooks is a solid defenseman, uh, but – if somebody's adding him, they're adding him as probably an eighth guy for a playoff run. So, it, no, I wasn't really surprised. So, when when you look at the one trade that was made, with all the speculation leading up to the Domi trade, was the return ultimately a little underwhelming? Or what do you th- make of the return? Well, I had, uh, you know, I talked to people and I I'd said, you know, all along, I thought the best you're going to get is the second round at, at the tops. But third round was probably going to be uh, where it was. And people that I talked to agreed with that, probably looking at a third round pick for Max. And um, they didn't get a third round pick, but they did get a guy that was taken in the third round by the Carolina Hurricanes. So I think in that regard, it kind of all, uh, they hashed it out the way that I thought it was going to go with that. 
Uh, it's disappointing because, you know, people are very quick to say, and, and, you know, to an extent there's a, you have a right to say, well, all you got for Josh Anderson was a college defenseman that may or may not play in the National Hockey League. And even though that's true, I don't look at it like the trade that was made this week um, wins or loses that deal, quite frankly, because when the Blue Jackets got Max Domi from the Montreal Canadiens, everybody thought that a centerman was coming the other way. Remember, that was the big thing. It was like, well, you know, Josh Anderson's a great power winger and uh, it's going to be tough to lose him, but you're getting a centerman on a team that is starved for centerman. And from the moment he came in and John Tortorella uh, figured out that he couldn't play the center position well enough defensively and put him on the wing, uh, you kind of lose that trade right there, in my opinion. I mean, you, you didn't get what you thought you were going to get. So right from the get-go, you thought you were getting a centerman, you didn't, and now you've got a college defenseman that hopefully someday plays in the National Hockey League. So it's, you know, you look at it how you want to look at it. It's disappointing, but we all knew Josh Anderson was leaving anyway after his contract was up. You're trying to get something out of that. They thought they had something, and I don't know, maybe if this kid plays a little bit in the NHL, they eventually do get something, but it's all how you break it down, I guess. Yeah. And the other guy, you brought him up a little bit earlier, was Jonas Corposalo, and I think there's some out there that believe, Bobby, that the, the team could have traded him earlier, maybe when there was a bigger value. Do you feel like that there was a missed opportunity there, or is it just a bunch of circumstances that led all of this? I think there was an opportunity earlier in the season. I think that it was more than one team that had some interest, but obviously Yarmo didn't get what he wanted for him at that point in time. So I can't say it's a lost opportunity because I don't know what the offers were coming back the other way. But if you were looking to move him um, just on that standpoint, uh, you could have done it earlier in the year. But again, you know, Yarmo is really a stickler for holding to what he wants and I know that drives some general managers nuts in the National Hockey League because he is so hard to deal with at times because he stands firm to what he is looking for. I mean, you talk about Domi getting traded. He didn't get traded Saturday or Sunday or Monday or uh, and not Monday until uh, 3 o'clock. I mean, he barely got in under the wire. So, you know, that's just Yarmo. He'll stare you down. Uh, <laughs> would you want to play poker with him? I wouldn't want to play poker with this guy. Uh, I can't tell when he's in a good mood most days anyway, let alone play poker with him. So. Uh, he's, he's very close to the best and he'll wait until he gets uh, what he wants. And he never, obviously never got what he wanted in a deal for Jonas Corposalo. And that's why Jonas is still here. We're going to get into this a little later with, with Mark's side of the things, but what, what's deadline day like for you, Bob, uh, just like, what, what, like, what's your day look like? A lot of people are interested in that kind of thing. Well, it's kind of fun. I mean, uh, this year I did uh, a couple of shows, two or three, depends on how you want to break it down. You know, I did a uh, late Sunday night. I did a, my Monday mailbag podcast answering fan questions. And that's the questions leading into that final day, not knowing what's going to happen that day. And then uh, we came back on live at uh, two o'clock uh, on Twitter spaces, which is, uh, you know, it's a relatively new thing. Uh, it's, we haven't done many shows on it, but it, it was great. And I, and I got to tell you what I was really impressed by with that is, you know, we had almost a thousand people on there at one point in time between two and mm -hmm. three in the afternoon. That really says a lot for the Blue Jackets fans and the interest in this team and the interest in that day to see what was going on. They, they want to know, they care. And, um, so we did that show and then we did a little uh, video after that. And then of course we had to travel to Pittsburgh that night. So it, it's, um, you know, it's a long day, but it's a fun day because it's a day of importance. It's a, a day that stands out on the NHL calendar. And even when your own team isn't active uh, very much, uh, other teams are. And there were some big names that moved around. So there's stuff to talk about. So it, it's good. It's, it's always good to have good hockey conversation. And trade deadline day is one of those days that gives you an automatic excuse to have those conversations. Hmm. Bob Miguel, get the radio voice of the Columbus Blue Jackets joining us on Union Junction. And Bobby, um, Trade deadline's gone, you know, it's short and sweet from Blue Jackets standpoint, as we talked about. There's still 18 games left in the season. I know they had the loss to Pittsburgh. What should we be watching for? What would you be watching for in these last 18 games, kind of knowing that the East playoffs is mostly set and it's probably not in the cards for them this year? I'll be watching for Michigan to lose. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's an alert. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really joking about that. I mean, yeah. if they win a national championship, that's great. That's 
it's great for all those players. It'd be great to have a player coming in that experienced the championship at some level. But mm-hmm. if they screw it up and get knocked out, I'm not going to be sad because uh, I'm ready for this guy to come. I want to see what he can do in the National Hockey League. Um, and, 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 Mark, you know from talking to me over the years, I am a huge proponent of go to the minor leagues, learn how to play, yeah. uh, learn how to be an NHLer before you get a chance to be an NHLer. But, my goodness, the game has changed so much, and, and guys can – step out of college now and step into the league. But this guy, to me, this guy's different because he's already played in the Olympics and he wasn't just there as an innocent bystander in the Olympics. He was producing in the Olympics amongst men. Um, Everything that I've seen, and I'm sure you guys have seen the same thing. You watch all the videos, you watch the highlights, an extremely talented forward. Whether he's going to play center like the Blue Jackets think he's going to, I don't know. I just know whether he plays center, whether he plays wing, this guy can play and he can make plays. And I'm looking forward to seeing it in the National Hockey League uh, sooner than later. I will bypass my own standards of go to the minor leagues and learn how to play. He doesn't need to. He can just come here and play. Not if he stinks, he can go to the American Hockey League and figure it out. <laughs> but I don't expect that that would be the case. But besides that, you know, besides anybody like uh, him that would come in, and I don't know, you know, there was – I don't know what's going on with the Kirill Marchenko thing. I don't think any, anybody does, right? right. Uh, because of the situation over Russia and Ukraine. So can they get him over here before the end of the year? I don't know. that Early in the year, that was like done deal. We're going to see him now. It's more like eh, maybe. So, uh, you know, watching new guys come in will be fun. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really – I want to watch two different things. I want to watch Sillinger and Chinikov continue to grow in these last couple of games because – this is it, right? You can see the end of the line. So uh, not that they have to impress the management to make the team next year, but I'm sure they want to finish strong. I want to watch them and make sure that they want to finish strong. And I feel very comfortable in saying, watching those two guys play all year and being around them, that they will want to finish strong. I want to watch that. And I want to watch, I want to watch a guy like Emil Bemstrom. Is he ever going to battle and show me something that says, that he should be here next year because I'm, I'm still waiting to see that. And he's, a, he's a great guy and he's a good teammate and all of that stuff. But I mean, there are wingers coming here and this guy's got three goals on the year and he's supposed to have this great shot. And, you know, you heard all the scouting reports about when he played in the Swedish league and had, uh, he was the first guy to score a ton of goals uh, since Peter Forsberg did it when he was in that league. We just haven't seen it. Just haven't seen it. And, and I, and I keep saying, okay, here's his chance. Maybe he'll grab it. Maybe he'll grab it. Look, he's got the 18 games or whatever is left. To uh, If I was a general manager, I would be focused in on that guy. I would go to that guy, and I would say, 18 games, kid. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with you next year. You've got 18 games to try to change my mind. You've got almost three years of it made up. You've got 18 games to try to change it and see if he would respond to that. And, and again, I'm not trying to beat up on the guy. I'm just saying facts are facts. There are players coming. And there are players that they're going to have to make room for. Um, We talked to Yarmo earlier today, and I asked him what he's going to be looking for between now and the end of the season. And one of the things he said is there are uh, players that are going to be unrestricted free agents that are not going to be able to resign with the team that they're with because of salary cap issues. And, oh, by the way, disclaimer, I've heard this for two years, and I haven't seen anybody come in. But but salary cap is staying flat, so I believe him. Uh, So they're going to be paying attention to the kind of players that they think they might be able to get in those situations. So what does that mean? That means there could be more faces and more people coming in. So, you know, if if you're a bubble guy, you've got these last five weeks to try to get off the bubble or get out of the bubble or whatever the phrase is to, to get on the, to get on the safe list. That's what you've got. So you mentioned uh, Ken Johnson with Michigan, Marchenko, Chinikov, Sillinger, there's so many other prospects in the system and they've still got two potential top 15 selections at the draft this year. Has there been another time in team history where there has been this much promise? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think a couple of years ago, we were talking about all these people that were coming. First of all, look, Marchenko and Voronkov, like these guys are like straw men. I, I've heard about these guys for three, four years. I haven't seen a lick of them yet. Right. Because they've been playing in the KHL. I'm almost to the point that, okay, I'll, I'll be a believer when they show up and I see them in a training camp. <laughs> um, but, yeah, there were there were times of depth, and then, you know, then they expended all that depth and got into the playoffs and 
traded away some picks and all that stuff. But uh, but I do agree with you. I think it, maybe it is a little bit more right now. Maybe it is. Here's what, here's what I think. Actually, now that I'm talking about this, uh, I'll tell you this. And this goes back to the time when I was in Syracuse in the American Hockey League um, in the first half of the existence of this franchise. We had guys there that were supposed to be prospects. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, some of them were good guys and they were good players, but they were good third, third and fourth line players. They didn't pan out to be the the uh, top six players that they were projected to be when they got drafted. So I would say from the standpoint of um, the, what you hear about and read about and see from the guys that are deemed prospects in this organization, this might be, um, you know, this might be the most talented group that is supposed to be coming through. I, I feel pretty safe in saying that because um, you know, the drafts early on were, uh, they were what they were, and I'm not picking on Doug McClain. He was starting a franchise from the ground up and not in the era of the Vegas Golden Knights or the Seattle Kraken. I mean, the old rules, which were much more tilted to protect protect the uh, teams that were already in existence. So uh, I, I think this is I think this is a talented group that is uh, that's coming. And I, I think it's it's as always, it's a group that has great potential. But, you know, potential. What's the saying? Always use uh, you don't buy groceries on potential. Right. You got to come up and you got to do it. And that's what we're going to find out here. Maybe later this year, maybe next year, maybe over the next three or four years. And Bobby, you've always had a front row seat, obviously with you calling the games on radio, you know, for several years now. And the one guy that I'm real curious about your take on here is Patrick Liney, just knowing what he was last year under Tortorella to what he's been able to do this year under Larson to be able to produce offensively, just how dramatic of a difference is it? And is this a situation that could potentially turn it into a long-term relationship between the Blue Jackets and Patrick Laine? Well, I think it better. I think it should. Um, and I think last year, you know, it's easy to single out Tortorella. And look, John Tortorella just kept him uh, honest or accountable is really the word. He kept him accountable. I mean, he screwed up in one game and he put him on the bench and he didn't put him back on the ice the rest of the way. And as you know, that was Pierre-Luc Dubois. That was Patrick Laine. That was Ryan Johansson. I mean, it didn't matter who you were. He scratched Cam Atkinson before. <laughs> I mean, it, you don't have to be a, a fourth-line guy or a third-line guy to go through that. You just have to be somebody that's not doing his job the right way, and that'll happen to you. And I really think that Patrick, now that I've been around Patrick and I get to, you know, to know him a little bit, just watch how he interacts with his teammates and all that stuff, I really think last year was hard for him when he left Winnipeg and he got sent here to Columbus. And that wouldn't be a big deal in a regular year, but it happened in the COVID year. When you're coming in, you've got no fans in the building. Uh, you're not allowed to do anything with your teammates. Your team meetings are supposed to be on Zoom. They're not supposed to be in person. I mean, for goodness sake, how are you supposed to get acclimated to what the heck is going on? And I think that really threw him for a loop because – you don't go from scoring 40 goals in the league to being as God awful as he was last year, just, just because, I mean, he wanted out of Winnipeg. That was obvious. And then that was asked for. So he gets out and he comes somewhere else. And then he was just terrible. I, I really think it was a situation of what last year was this year back to normal, right? Normal training camp, hang with your teammates, um, you know, just be able to go and do things be around and, you know, and he knew Brad Larson from last year, and, and he knew that the accountability factor was not going to change. But he also knew that it was going to be loosened up a little bit offensively, and he was going to be able to play the game that he plays. But as you've seen in the last month, this guy's playing a two-way game. I mean, he's back-checking. He's, and there are still some games. I thought in Pittsburgh, I really didn't notice him at all. He didn't you know, – took a couple of shots and missed the net, and he really wasn't a factor. But that's what happens when the good teams key on you and they take you out of the game. We've seen that a number of times. And that's the thing. Look, Gus Nyquist is playing really, really well with him. But Gus isn't one of those guys where you're, you're so scared to death that he's going to kill you if you don't double cover, or double cover Patrick, right? So it's not like when you put Crosby and Malkin on the same line and then it's pick your poison. Um, you know, Patrick's going to draw the bulk of the defensive attention. And, you know, with some teams, uh, he gets through it a little bit better than other teams because of the caliber of the player on the other side. But. I think he's been great. This is a team that is uh, that has been in the past a goal-starved team. This is a guy that can score goals. The money has to be right. The term has to be right. Maybe it's not eight years. Maybe it's an Austin Matthews five-year type of a deal with a uh, salary cap hit that you can swallow. Um, 
I, I don't know how they work it out, but I would really be surprised if they don't find a way to work it out. You mentioned a bit of the loosening under a uh, loosening of the reins under Brad Larson. What do you make of him in his first year as coach? And are there any like coach comparables that you've seen from him? Well, I, to be honest with you, I don't think a lot has changed since John Tortorella left, to be honest. Uh, yes. He has loosened it up a little bit. So instead of two to one games, they're uh, five, three, six, four games. All right. And sometimes that's great. It's always great for the fans to see a lot of goals, but sometimes you'd like to see it be a little bit more locked down and, and defensive. They don't pack it in front of the goaltender like they used to. And, you know, five guys packed in and blocking shots all over the place. Uh, they still block shots. Maybe the goalies wish they would pack five guys in front of them, but the way it's gone for those two guys this year, they probably were wishing that they would. But, um, but yeah, I think he's just uh, – he, he's got the same uh, ideals as John Tortorella. There's the same accountability level. There's uh, the same work ethic level that has to go on. Uh, the difference is he just approaches the players in a different way, whereas Torts would – not really go out of his way to um, to get close personally with the players. It wasn't that he didn't like them, but, you know, it was always like that, you know, I, I can't be your friend and your boss at the same time type of a thing, right? I think Brad Larson walks a different line with that, and it works. It, it obviously works because the team is getting better. Uh, the team is overachieved. I feel safe in saying that. I think they've overachieved this year. Uh, I didn't expect they would be horrible like all the media people from outside of Columbus thought they would be, but – They've been better than I thought that they, they would be just overall with the way they play and uh, their their structure and their identity and whatever other keyword you want to use with it. I mean, they, they've done a good job. So that's a reflection on him and his coaching staff. I mean, he, he brought in uh, Pascal Vincent, and that's a guy that he wanted coming in from the Winnipeg organization. Pascal has done a really good job on the special teams uh, or on the power play in particular. But he's got some decent weapons there. But Steve McCarthy came from uh, Cleveland. He wasn't supposed to be here. That was basically a last-minute change uh, for him to come here and coach. He's a young guy. It's his first year in the National Hockey League. And, you know, somebody could say to me, well, the defensemen, that's, maybe that's why the defensemen are having a problem. No, the defense is young and inexperienced. And, um, you know, he, he's done a really good job with these guys, and they love him. They trust him. I talk to all of them about him. And, and they, uh, you know, they rave about him and the way that he – talks to you and, and he lets you play. He doesn't beat you up for every single mistake. He doesn't take you out of the game and bench you when you make a mistake. It's about learning and go back out there and figure it out. And uh, so I think Brad has done a good job. I think he did a good job in the selection of the guys that he put around him. And I think all of them have done a good job to get this team to where it is right now. I kind of I just got a couple more here for Bobby. You know, you segued right into my next question, talking about the defense. Thing. That's what I do, Mark. That's what <laughs> I do. That's why I am who I am. That's why you are who you are, and people <laughs> should listen to your opinions, right? Well, um, but the, the defense, though, I think a lot of fans would say, you know, they look at the stats. You know, a lot of shots in the league, like almost dead last in the league, you know, one of the most go goals against in the league. Yeah, definitely some inexperience there. But do you feel like that that's something that they have to try to address in the offseason or can they just depend on the development or kind of them taking the next step in order to get better there? I think they can do either of those things. I, I think obviously one could be a speedier process than the other. But uh, Jake Bean is going to develop. Jake Bean's going to get bigger. He's going to get stronger. Adam Boquist is going to get bigger and get stronger and play better defense as he goes along. Uh Andrew Peak, uh, Andrew Peak is he has surprised me and impressed me so much this year with the strides that he made. Back in training camp, we were talking about him. You know, is he going to be on the third pair or is he going to be a seventh guy trying to get into the mix? And and he's playing top pair and he has been for a long time. And uh, you know, kind of to your question, if they went and addressed some things from the outside, and if they got a true top pair defenseman to go with Zach Wierenski, then Andrew Peak would have to slide down. And I think eventually when you do have a good team, he probably does slide down. But I'm not saying that as a knock on him. I think that the experience that he is getting right now is going to be invaluable for him um, as it goes along with wherever he's playing and with whoever he's playing with. He's, he's a better player now for what he's gone through this year. So uh, they can do it either way. They, they can uh, let these guys develop or if they get the opportunity through unrestricted free agency or through a trade. You know, I was teasing Andrew Peake. I saw him today and I said, that, uh, you know, he and Jacob Chicken are good buddies because they played together as kids down in Florida. And I said, uh, so look, you're going to call 
uh, Jacob Chicker and get this done for Yarmo and bring him in here this summer. What's going on with this? And, and he just laughed. And, and you know, and obviously that would be great in some ways. And yeah, depending on what you have to give up the other way, <laughs> who knows? Maybe not so great. But yeah, um, yeah they could adjust, address it either way. And I, I don't know which way they will go with it, to be honest with you, Mark, because mm-hmm. – I, I can sit here and tell you Yarmo is a patient guy and he likes the group that he has and he's going to let them develop. But, um, you know, Kukin's going to be on his way out. Gabriel Carlson, I mean, again, another guy that I love, but he was a first round pick and he's, you know, in and out of the lineup. Uh, you could strengthen there from going to the outside. There's no question about that. So, and, and maybe, maybe just talking about those two guys in particular, maybe they will feel they need to get at least one guy to put back there and uh, somebody with experience and get, getting somebody with experience isn't going to hurt that group. I'll tell you that right now. Mm. So you mentioned a bit of the defense. It's, it is a bit of a log jam back there though. Cause I mean, Bean is the guy who is expected to grow into a top four guy. Same with, you know, Gavrikov's top four, Wierenski's top four, both quests expected. And uh, you mentioned also peak hopping in there. Um, do you think there's going to be a log jam to the point where one of these guys is going to have to move? Or what, what do you oh, think is so. going to ultimately become of that? I hope so, because that's a good thing, right? If, if you have a guy playing as a sixth defenseman that thinks he should be a fourth or would be a fourth on a good team, but he can't get into the top four because you're just that good ahead of him, that's a good problem to have. So um, I don't know how it's all going to work out with their development, but that is not, you know, if it was me and, and I was putting together the team, that would be a problem that I would be praying that I would have to deal with because that would put me in a really good spot. And it would mean that you would have somebody that you would be able to flip and get something else that you need. Right. I mean, maybe you find out you need a, another forward and you have a defenseman that you could move to get that forward or, or a goaltender, whatever the case may be. Um, those are always great problems to have. So uh, I hope they have to deal with that. My last one for you, Bobby, just the, off season, you know, Kekalayan actually spoke um, after the deadline and referenced that he thought that most of the moves that they would be looking to make would be done in the off season, just because current teams aren't going to give up their roster players. I mean, are we talking, could we see a blockbuster or is it just more of, you know, they'll find guys that they feel like will just fit into, you know, what they're looking for. Um, I would say Yarmo. I think Yarmo, he, he would never admit this if I asked him, but I think he loves to pull off the blockbuster. I think that I, I look, I saw him do two of them, and so did you. And I, I remember the day it was announced that Brandon Sod was coming from Chicago. And I was like, what? Where did that come from? Never even heard that. Yeah. Never even heard that rumor around. I was listening to Pittsburgh radio that day, and it was great because at the time they wanted him, and then they didn't get him. Yeah. So then they went out and got Phil Kessel, and that worked out okay for them. But, um, but yeah. so he got Brandon Sod, and then when he recognized that wasn't going to work, he quietly under the radar finds a way to get our Timmy Panarin out of Chicago. Like, how was that guy ever even available? And how did Yarmo get him to come out of there? And you know, we enjoyed a couple of great years watching him play yeah. and do the magical things he does with the puck. So, uh, I think that is something that Yarmo is good at. I, I I know he's really good at uh, keeping the lid on things and not letting it get out. And in today's world of social media, I still don't know how he kept both of those things quiet for crying out loud. But um, I don't think he's afraid to swing for the fences, but it's got to be the right pitch. You know what I mean? He's not just going to go out and get a guy with a name who he doesn't think is going to fit into the group that he already has here. And that would be stupid. And uh, he doesn't do stupid stuff like that. So uh, it could go either way. He could just be looking to fill in around the edges. But I really think, especially with what we've seen this year and how this team did perform, I think you would be silly if you didn't uh, go with the train of thought that, you know what, you're closer to this reload thing than than everybody might think that you are. And I'm going to tell you this. I, I mm-hmm. spent the last week talking to guys on this team about the group that they have. and And maybe some people think we overplay this stuff, but they really like each other. They really do. And they play for each other. So you got to get a guy that fits into that mold. But players aren't stupid either. They might be sorry to see their friend go. But if their friend is going to go for somebody that comes in that can really help you win more games and get back into the playoffs um, and is a good teammate, they'll make that adjustment pretty quick. And fans, that's why he's the best. Bob McGilligan, make sure you follow him if you don't already at Bobby Max Sports. 
got good shows, CBJ and 30, doing the Twitter spaces. You can find them out there. Interesting game on um, coming up on Friday night. Patrick Liney and Jack Roslovic returning to Winnipeg. That should be a scene. Yeah, that should be. It's funny you say that. I didn't even think about that, to be honest with you, because it seems like they've been here for so long and, and they haven't. And we didn't play Winnipeg last year. So uh, that's a good point. That'll be that'll be a good scene. I'm, I'm sure that uh, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I'm pretty sure that they'll get a, a nice reception going back there. Uh, you know, especially Patrick. He did some really good things there as a player. And then, uh, then you get through that and you go to Minnesota on Saturday and boy, I got my fingers crossed that Mark Andre Fleury plays on I, Saturday night in Minnesota. I, I think really he do. is. Um, I think oh, Russo, Michael Russo tweeted that they expect Fleury to play Saturday night. So, well, if Michael Russo says it, it's gotta be true because he's <laughs> got his finger on the pulse of everything that is the Minnesota wild. <laughs> As you do to the blue jackets, Bobby, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here. Well, I appreciate that. I know I happen to be out and I'm in the car right now, but I want to get those backdrops, not your backdrop, Mark. I want those, I want that picture backdrop there. Show me that again. Uh, it's just a bunch of vinyl. That's just vinyl? Yeah. I yeah. made the frames myself and yeah. Oh, there you go. I like that. Yeah. That is, see, that is work. That is work that's well worth it. Well done on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you guys it's been great talking to you yeah tonight. thank you so much bobby and fans will be right back and we'll wrap up the show i well, just got done with a great interview with bob mcgalligat um, with, um blue jackets radio um a lot of really good stuff you know i'm sure fans you've seen him do you know cbj and 30 you've seen him do the twitter spaces you hear his calls on radio just does a really good job he does a great job having the the, the pulse of the team you know he's very opinionated but um, you know, <laughs> very, very, very knowledgeable at that. So what would you take away from the interview, Nick? Honestly, it, it, just talking about Miguel again was, was pretty sweet. Uh, just a legend in the Blue Jackets uh, organization, that community. Uh, really, uh, just loved hearing his perspective on deadline day a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is busy, but it is one of those days that people look forward to of kind of like Christmas Day, we heard uh, the TV play-by-play -play guy say uh, how how much he was looking forward to it, like it was Christmas Day and all that kind of stuff. So cool to get a wrap up on it, and uh, glad that we had Bob to come talk about it. Absolutely. I mean, I've known him. Well, when I first started covering the Columbus Blue Jackets, it was in the summer of 2014, the year that they drafted Sonny Milano. I'm in the middle of the first round, and I just. I, one uh, so before getting involved you know he was still doing cbj and 30 but it was kind of in a different format and i was actually i bombarded him with questions but he was always so nice always appreciated the interaction then got to meet him in buffalo like one of my first credentialed games was in buffalo against um for the blue jackets and you know just from that point forward you could tell that you know that role fits him perfectly you know he, he just he gets it. And he, and he's also worked really hard to, he's been with Syracuse, worked his way up. He's, he's done things the right way as well. So, you know, he deserves the opportunity and, you know, I think bigger and better things are certainly going to come and, you know, he's going to be one of the soundtracks of the blue jackets moving forward here. And I think that a lot of fans should be looking forward to that. Definitely seems to love what he do, like what he does. Yeah. Um, and speaking of that, Mark, mm. we know that you love what you do. Indeed. Uh, earlier in the week, you made it down to Nationwide for the uh, for the trade deadline day. Would love to just get your perspective on how that day went for you. What does that look like? And uh, what was going on inside the arena? So do the, the quick couple minutes version of the story. So now we'll get into it. So five o'clock in the morning was my wake up call at home. As if for me, it's about a little more than a three hour drive. You know, do all the stuff to get ready, um, eat breakfast along the way, do all that sort of stuff. Got to the arena maybe a little bit before 10 o'clock. Um, you know, they was practice at 11 o'clock, didn't want to get there too early, but around 1030 got settled in. Um, trades were already, well, all the deadline shows were going on. You know, the media room was already open. That's where we kind of set up camp for the whole day. You know, this is the point now where you're watching all the deadline shows, you're talking to various sources around the league like, you know, through your phone, through Twitter, you know, what, you know, whatever it ends up being. Um, then practice came up, you know, we went out and saw, you know, 
Max Domi wasn't out there. And, you know, we, we came into it with the expectation that he was going to be dealt by the three o'clock deadline. So that only just fueled more speculation. And then just from that point forward, just being in the room and I, I literally had three different deadline shows on toward the end of the day. I was watching the ESPN plus feed. We had the NHL network feed on in the media room. And then I was also watching daily face off where earlier in the day, there were simulcasts of both Sportsnet and TSN. So we were watching those early in the day, but then the States had their own version. I thought they did a great job with their coverage. You know, Kevin Weeks was an absolute legend the way that he was breaking trades in different places. And, you know, we just couldn't get enough of that. But then, um, you know, the Blue Jackets were pretty quiet the whole day for the most part until, you know, right at the end when right before the gun, the Max Domi deal happened. And, you know, we started to get an idea that that was going on. But then Kekalainen came into the room and, you know, said that the trade call hadn't even been done yet. And then admitted that there were 33 trades in the queue and that just, that took off. You know, there's some things that you put out there, you just don't know what goes viral. And I think it scared a lot of people because they're like, wait a minute, are there 33 more trades that are actually going to be coming in? I think um, the way that he said it, um, you had, to, you had to look at it from the perspective of there were about 24, 25 trades that were leaked before they became official from the team account because they hadn't completed the trade call with central registry yet. And the reason that the Domi call didn't go through was because there were 33 trades in the queue and some of them hadn't had the trade call completed. They're basically, they were on hold with central registry. So the team couldn't announce it. Um, they had to go through that whole process before they could make it official but it really took off and it made for some interesting theater and then come in to find out later that two and a half hours at five 30 Eastern after the deadline, there were still teams on hold with central registry. So I literally was at the arena until a little bit after five 30, because we were waiting for the official team announcement of the trade. And we, you know, we came to find out that it was a three team trade, that there was going to be some retained salary, um, and I knew I was going to be in Pittsburgh the next night. So I kind of made an executive decision. We pretty much had everything in order. We're just waiting for the official, like I'm going to head off to Pittsburgh as I had a, a drive ahead of me. And so you know, the, the day was surreal um, in, in that sense, just being there, seeing all the things go down. Um, it was very, very interesting. And then to be able to talk to Kekalainen as well, to give, you know, his account of, you know, what he could about the deal and then some of the things that did and did not happen. And he kind of implied that the off season could be big because some of their targets would probably be more attainable in the off season because teams aren't going to give up their roster players now when they're going into a playoff push. So it left a lot of room for the future here, but I ended up arriving at my um, hotel at a little bit after eight 30, um, to be ready for the penguin game only to wake up the next day completely sick to my stomach that I couldn't even hardly function. So I just made a decision like, look, I, I can't do this. I got to take care of myself. I didn't want to get anybody else sick in case I had something worse. And I ended up going home after that, but now it would have been an 11 o'clock morning skate, seven o'clock game that night in Pittsburgh. And then I would have been home by midnight. So that two day stretch was a lot of hockey, a lot of travel, but Hope that gives you a little bit of insight into what we actually go through on a basis when we go on a trip. So it, three o'clock hits, uh, you know, the Domi has been moved. It kind of seemed like a scramble to kind of get the return. At one point it seemed like Korshkov was going to the blue jackets too. Like, what does it look like when people are trying to drum up what that return is? You should have seen. Yeah. So to give you a perspective of the media. So in the media room, I was there. Aaron Portsline was in the room. Brian Hedger was in the room. Bailey Johnson with the dispatch was in the room. Um, everyone was kind of scrambling to find out what the return was. So you're, this is the point where you're trying to talk to people to see what you can get. I had heard that there was going to be some retained salary and it only made sense because the, the hurricanes were in LTIR. Um, I think Elliot Friedman was the first one to mention um, Hirschchuk as the prospect coming back. And I think um, Korshkov's name ended up coming into play, not, not 100% sure how, but at least the name was mentioned. And then it was just a waiting game at that point because 
they were still waiting for central registry to get the trade call completed and you knew there was going to be retained salary and then with the 50 percent rule and then did that open the opportunity that there had to have been a third party broker because carolina was so strapped to the cap that they couldn't take on more than um the, the, the way that it worked here, the Domi is a 5.3 cap hit. So 50%, the most they could retain is 2.65. Carolina didn't have 2.65 in cap space available at the time. So there had to be a third party broker in order to make it work. And that's where Florida came in and took on 25%, which allowed Carolina to take on the other 25%, which were was able to fit in under their cap. So Florida ended up getting... Um, a draft pick out of it and you know the way a three wheel way deal works it's actually two separate deals first one between the panthers and the blue jackets and then the second one um between the blue jackets and the hurricanes so yeah it, it, it's really interesting when you're trying to fit all the pieces together you're talking to different sources like in that case the you you know, without giving names here, you're talking to people who are familiar with the Panther side, you're talking to people who are familiar with the hurricane side, and you're trying to just put, it's like putting a puzzle together. And, you know, sometimes you're beaten to the punch um, in terms of maybe another media member is able to, to glean that, but then you wait for confirmation. And that, that's pretty much what we were doing. And then waiting until the official trade call happened when the team released, um, what the actual trade was and then trying to make sense of it all because of how complicated it ended up being. So it's pretty surreal. Yeah. And that's just for one deal. Imagine if they had been more busy, you guys uh, might have a lot less hair on Tuesday. Uh, thanks Mark. Really yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. I'm, I'm no, sure absolutely. everybody loves to hear that kind of stuff. Well, and, and that's what we'll do moving forward with the show as well. You know, we, if there's ever a question that, um, you know, you want to ask or fans want to ask, but I'm probably going to write a piece in the off season about the day in the life of a hockey writer. Cause I think you make a good point that a lot of fans love that sort of stuff. Like what do we go through on a daily basis? You know, how does it work about getting, you know, hotels, maybe flights, if you have to go on a longer road trip, like across the country, stuff like that. You know, what is it actually like, when do you actually write? How do you come up with topic? Those are things that I think fans would crave. And that's something that I think that, over the summer, you know, we, we won't have as many shows, but I still think we can get together maybe once a month, something like that when it's true off season, maybe we can dedicate a show to just fan questions about whatever. And we can discuss things like that. As I, as I think that would be very popular. Like you said, once again, a great idea from Mark Shag. Indeed. We you know it's a better idea. STN bets.com. The new THW betting guide. Make sure that you check it out. A lot of great content out there. It's a new endeavor that we're doing that I think that we're very confident in. I think will be very popular. So if you want fantasy advice, if you want betting advice, if that's your thing, you want to get some different perspectives, stnbets.com. Any sport, especially hockey, all out there at your fingertips. Compliments of the hockey writers. Fans, thank you seriously for joining us. You know, Bobby was really, really good. He was really insightful as always in terms of just having the pulse of the Blue Jackets and giving a perspective that kind of keeps things even keel as well for what we can expect. Um, we should be back here next week. We'll have a regular show, plenty to talk about. You know, the, the game in Winnipeg with the Patrick Line and Jack Roslevic reunion. They play the Minnesota Wild after that. Check this out. So we're we're sitting here you're going to see this episode drop on the 24th of march they have one home weekend game left the rest of this season they're done with saturday they only have one sunday game left and that's near the end of april against edmonton so one o'clock on a sunday game and that is it all of their home games the rest of the year the very few that they have are during the week it's a sign that the season is really coming to an end quickly so only 18 games to go nick wow that's an interesting stat. Yeah, for sure. But fans, thank you. Um, have a great week. Enjoy the games. And we'll see you next time here on Union Junction.